Well, folks, this is your lucky day because I know you guys all woke up this morning wondering about those wires in your basement, right? Who was who? Everybody, right? There you go. So today we're going to talk about those wires in your basement. And, and uh, who feels like they, they really have control over their wires in their basement? Huh? Beth does. And, and, and so two out of, what do we have? 20 here. Okay, 21. Why do you think Beth has control over her wires in her basement? There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's uh, move forward a little bit. And, and first we'll talk about who is this guy standing in front of you professing to know about those wires in your basement. Well, I've been living with basement wires for a long time. It's like since I was a little kid, that's what fascinated me. <laughs> I needed to know what those wires were all about. And here I am today. And... and uh, I'm a specialist in the wires in your basement. Uh, I started out literally in high school working on security systems. I worked for my school system's AV equipment repair shop. So this is back in 1971, and I got hired in ninth grade. I was repairing uh, the 16 millimeter film projectors, record players, and, and uh, all, the, all the stuff that was the audio visual equipment in the school system of the day. One of the guys that, that I was working for in that repair shop had an alarm business on the side, and I became his helper. So throughout the 70s while I was in high school, on weekends I was installing security systems and also television antennas because back then, of course, we didn't have cable, and everybody had a 40-foot tower in their backyard. I was the guy that, that would climb the tower to put the antenna on top after the tower went up. <laughs> so uh, out of high school, I joined the Navy, I was an electronics technician and a reactor operator, so I, I learned a lot about, obviously, electronics and also a lot about physics, uh, chemistry, the sciences. Uh, from there, I used my GI Bill to major in physics at Manhattan College. Uh, the GI Bill ran out after five semesters, so that's when my education took a hiatus and I had three kids. But fast forward a few years and my son is now, you know, graduating high school. This is now uh, he's 28, so do the math, it's more than 10 years ago. And I started back into school. I went to the University of New Haven, and I got an engineering degree in fire protection systems. So that allows me to go into the office building clients that I had previously been doing card access and camera systems for, and take over the fire alarm systems. So it was a nice way for me to expand my business. And I've done that very successfully now over the last maybe six or seven years. So well, one of the things that, that I, I really love working on is fire alarm systems. It's a more limited market, less competition, higher profit margins, more specialized, and, and something that, that we do a really great job with. So that's a little bit about me. Okay, now who could tell me if this looks familiar? Is that what's under your desk in your study? Very likely. How about this? Does that look like the television wires in your basement? Right, because that's what that is, right? This is that little distribution block that feeds the signal to all the jacks throughout your house. Doesn't look like it's mounted to anything. It's definitely not grounded. Uh, so this is, this is all pretty typical, okay? That, that's a typical alarm box, right? So what we're talking about today is network wiring, telephone wiring, TV set, cable television wiring, AV wiring, your burglar alarm system, your fire alarm system, this is all low voltage. And, and it's, it's those little wires that you see running around the perimeter of your basement. We're talking about important things that those wires do. Like, for example, gas detection, uh, often overlooked. People put carbon monoxide detectors in their houses, but they don't think about the flammable gas, propane, or natural gas, which is methane, in their homes. This is the most dangerous thing you could possibly have in your house. And it's one of the biggest things that alarm companies overlook is, is a gas detector for flammable gases. Camera systems, a lot of people are thinking about having cameras in their homes now. It's becoming more and more common. 
intercoms that would let you talk to who's at the front door rather than opening it and, and, and seeing them face to face. Low temperature detection. This is a really good one. You can have a burglar and fire alarm system. Go to your insurance company and, and typically you'll see maybe a 10% discount on your homeowner policy. But if you add a $10 low temperature sensor, you'll get another 5%. Because what do the insurance companies care about? A lot. Frozen, Frozen pipes. Huge. So a $10 sensor, if, and, and this is something that most alarm companies won't mention because it doesn't change the dynamics of their recurring revenue, right? Most alarm companies are focused on one thing, recurring revenue. And they really, they're not sending knowledgeable representatives out to your home to ask the right questions, to look at, do you have ga uh, flammable gases in your house? People never, salespeople from alarm companies never ask, what is the fuel source in, in your, your home? Flood detection, another, another big one. Do you have a sump pump? That's another $10 sensor to monitor whether or not you have water on the floor. Doesn't cost you any more per month, but insurance companies would sure love to see you have that. And central station monitoring. So now this is the kind of work we do. A uh, couple things I'll point out. This is grounding, okay? So that, that is tied to a proper ground, and, and it runs into the alarm control panel right there. And, and so what that does is that protects you from lightning. Super important. Another thing very few alarm companies do. It's an extra step that you would never know whether they did or not. But it is required by code. NFPA 72, National Electrical Code. If a product is providing a terminal for grounding, it must be grounded because the manufacturer is, is the authority having jurisdiction with respect to that feature of the National Electrical Code. Here, here's another big thing that you'll never see other alarm companies do. You see there's two batteries here, okay? Well, the alarm control panel, this is the heart of your alarm system, has extra power, auxiliary power it's called. And that's gonna power things like gas detectors, smoke detectors, motion sensors, but it all, all those devices put a load on the system. And, and oops, sorry folks. So if you look over here, there's a, there's a, a metal uh, feature right there. It's actually a heat sink for the power supply. It's, it's called a voltage regulator. Just like any doctor who takes a stethoscope and listens to your heart and your lungs, when I walk into a, a new system, I put my fingers on that metal because I can tell by the temperature of, of the heat sink of the voltage regulator if the panel is overloaded or not. And that's huge because the panel will burn out sooner, it won't last if there's a power failure, and uh, what we do is, whoop, sorry, we put in a, uh, a second power supply, we call it an auxiliary power supply. So we shed the load off of the alarm control panel and power motion sensors, gas detectors, uh, the siren driver card, uh, which is this little guy here, uh, all with the auxiliary power supply. So here's, here's another little thing. Uh, that's about a $20 circuit board that we install. Most alarm companies put in a sounder, everybody puts in a sounder, but the cheap way to do it is to let the, the alarm panel put out either a steady voltage to make the sounder sound or a pulsating voltage to make the sounder sound so you could uh, theoretically differentiate between a burglar alarm condition and a fire alarm condition. Who can tell me which is the fire alarm condition, right? What if you're out to dinner and you got a babysitter watching your kids or you're away on vacation and your parents are staying home? Are they going to know whether the steady sound or the pulsing sound is the burglar alarm or the fire alarm? No way in the world. So what we do is we put this little circuit board in here which is a voice message. If it's a fire, you're going to hear fire, fire, leave immediately. Huge difference. Think of the worry you don't have to carry with you when, when your kids are home with a babysitter or, or somebody else is staying in your house if there's a fire. Fire is, is crazy fast spreading. It, 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 and if you can do a better job for 20 bucks of getting somebody out of your house in a fire emergency, wouldn't you want to do it? I think so. Quick, and I'm, I'm going to run through this really quick, I know because we don't have a lot of time, but the cable modem. This is really important now in today's security systems because it's how your alarm system communicates with the outside world. So where you place your cable modem and how you back it up with extra power is, is very, very important today. 
many, many people have their cable modems on, on the floor under the desk where their computer is located. And it doesn't have a backup power supply. This is very, very typical. When you switch from the old style AT&T frontier phone lines that are hardwired to the phone poles and get your phone line through a cable modem, the cable company comes in, they put in the cable modem, usually close to the computer, because that way the internet that comes out of the back of that cable modem can just be fed right into the computer. So then what they do is the phone, the dial tone, the phone line that comes out of the back of that cable modem, they just jumper it to the nearest phone jack in your house. Okay? What they're doing is they're back feeding the phone line from the nearest phone jack to the cable modem, and it's going to show up on all the other phone jacks in the house because all the phone jacks are wired together in the basement. So valid, except for one thing, if you have an alarm system. If you have an alarm system, now the phone line, the dial tone, right, is on the wrong side of the alarm system because the alarm system needs to have dibs on the phone line first. That way it can seize the line, literally with, with us a relay switch. It disconnects all the jacks in the house and it takes over that phone line for about 30 seconds while it sends out its signal. Well, unless your alarm system sends in a test signal on a, on a weekly basis, that central station is not going to know whether or not your alarm panel has dial tone or not. So here's a very interesting thing to ask your alarm company. Do you have weekly test signals monitored? Shouldn't cost you any more money because it, it doesn't cost me any more money as an alarm company to wholesale that service from my central station, but I provide that for every single one of my customers. That way, I know within a week if something goes wrong with their cable modem, their phone line, if they're disconnected from the central station. Without that feature, you will not know until you need the system. Often what happens is you'll have a smoke detector triggered by something burning in the kitchen or steam coming out of the bathroom. It'll set the fire alarm off, and what will happen is, in, in the past, before I had this across the board with all my accounts, I'd get a phone call and say, you know, my fire alarm just went off, but the fire department didn't come. And I'll say, did you change your phone service? Oh, yeah, we got, we got a cable modem six months ago, four months ago. Well, unfortunately, for the last four months or six months, your alarm system wasn't being monitored because it was on the wrong side of where the dial tone comes from. Okay, so very important that your cable modem is properly wired if you get one to your alarm system. Okay, cable television distribution. Something else we do, it's coaxial wire. Uh, I, I pointed out that picture where that block was hanging from the rafters, ungrounded. So a couple things about that quickly. The amount of signal that comes into your house for cable television is fixed. It's at a certain level. And it's very important that you distribute that signal properly. You don't want unterminated jacks in your house. because And, and so what you saw there was like a, an eight-channel distributor of cable television, right? It was a big block with, with cable wires feeding all over the place. I doubt they had eight television sets on that block. Well, what happens is all those jacks around the house that don't have television sets on them, they diminish the amount of energy that is going to the cable boxes where you do have television sets. It's a 10 cent part. It's called a terminator. It puts a 75 ohm resistor at the end of that line. If you do that, you'll have much stronger signal at your cable boxes just by screwing this little thing into the unused cable jacks in your house. Nobody does that except Lexco. We carry those. Most alarm companies don't even know about that. The little things, stereo speakers, centralized systems with remote control. So this can be very scary because there's a lot of choices out there. Most people buy too much technology when it comes to audio video and they don't know how to use it. They get these crazy remote controls or these crazy apps on, on tablets, and, and it's just way more than you need. We are minimalists. We're not going to oversell you the stuff that you don't need. It, you know, I, I was at a meeting last night, and one of the stories I heard was 
these high net worth individuals have uh, these houses all over the place. They have different systems in every estate. They go, they go to their summer home, their winter home. They can't turn on their television sets. They don't know how to play their audio systems. It's, it's just, it's crazy, but it's because they have too much technology. They just, they overbought it. So we're gonna help you make simple choices, right? Maybe you want some speakers around your house, but the, the, really the easiest way to do that is just from a, a centralized stereo source, have what's called a speaker selector box, okay? It's, it's, it's the least expensive way you can have great audio throughout your house. And you can just adjust the volume right at your stereo for the speakers that you have out on your patio or in your kitchen or whatever. Point is you have a lot of options and we're gonna help you make the right choices. We talked about gas detectors, temperature sensors, and water detectors. Camera systems, this is where people make a lot of mistakes. They go to Costco, they go to Walmart, they see, holy cow, I can get 16 cameras and a recorder for $3.99. That's a home run because, you know, they, they know that the alarm company's gonna want a lot more than that. And so they buy this thing and, and they bring it home and it's just absolute cra <coughs> crap. It, it, first of all, the cameras are the lowest quality cameras. Half of them probably don't even work when you turn them on. The recorder, you have no support. You have no place to turn to figure out how to review it or attach it to the internet or anything like that. Camera systems can be really good, but they can also be way overdone. So the first thing you really need to do is why are you having it? Well, the biggest value that a camera system offers, believe it or not, is just a visual deterrency. So having a camera exposed really does send a very strong message. People don't want to be recorded in, in their criminal activity. So that's just something to think about right there. But then why, why do you want a camera system? What, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. And, and that's not an easy question sometimes because the, you need to have it working in the dark, right? Um, so again, those cheap cameras are not going to give you good images at night. And, and that may be the reason, whole reason why you have it. Okay, we talked a little bit about workmanship. This is, this is what's gonna prevent you from having false alarm fines. It's gonna make it so that your system can be serviced efficiently. It's, it's gonna make it so that you are in control of your wiring, not somebody else. These are some of the things that you wanna ask for. Whoever is doing the low voltage work in your house, proper grounding. Proper terminations, uh, just really clean, professional workmanship. The, the right kind of splicing, you know, you used to hear me talk about we solder every splice. I kind of got away from that because who knows what soldering is. Well, a quick lesson in soldering, it's the best way to attach two wires because what you do is you keep the air out of the splice when you solder. So when you take two wires and twist them together, if you don't solder them, over time, the oxygen in the air, right? 21% oxygen is gonna cause oxidation. Oxidation is gonna diminish the quality of that splice for conducting electricity. After a certain number of years, the quality of that splice is gonna degrade so much that it begins to put you into a false alarm region. But if you solder it, that'll never happen. Not in 50 years or 100 years. Your alarm system will stay reliable with soldered splices. Labeling. Just makes it easier to service. So we put a, a little numerical label at the end of every wire in the alarm control panel and we create a little list. Now we know what every wire is and where it goes. No mystery. Documentation, that list with the wire labels on it. The installation instructions and the operating instructions for your system. You want to keep those. Warranty. So we give a full year warranty on parts and labor, except certain parts where the manufacturer has more than a year. Like for example, in our camera systems, our, our recorders, the uh, DVRs and NVRs are a three year warranty, and we extend that to you guys. So that's the uh, story of Lexco, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you very much.